Hello, everyone, and thank you for standing by for the improvement of Gear Life and Performance webinar. Uh, my name is Michel Frison. I'm the Vice President of Global Sales at Nitrix Turnkey System, and today I will be your moderator. Um, we're glad to you can join us today. We're very happy from people all over the world joining us today. Uh, a few you notes before we start. Uh, you're invited to submit your question to the question and answer box on your screen. Uh, we will do our best to answer as many questions as we can. Uh, at the end of the presentation, if there's any question remaining, though, uh, feel free to put your email and uh, we can respond to you directly. Um, this webinar will be recorded and will be available in the coming days. In today's webinar, uh, we will have uh, the honor of uh, having Mr. Jack Kaluki uh, and Mark Emsat will give us a deep dive perspective on nitriding and carburizing of gears. And now those, uh, these surface treatment can help you get the most out of your gears. With that, I would like to introduce the panelists uh, with, uh, with me today. Uh, Mr. Jack Kaluki, uh, technical, technological advisor, joined Nitrex Metal in 1990. His first position was assistant sales engineer and was similarly in charge of customer service. As the company operation and acquisition expanded worldwide, he moved to contract coordination and management. He also headed the e-treating and technology department at the Nitrix Montreal Canada facility for over a decade. Today, Jack Kaluki continues to work as a representative and techn technological advisor in North America and parts of Europe. Uh, our second panelist, Mr. Mark Emsat, Vice President of Sales, E-Treat Services America, has over 30 years experience in the E-Treat industry as a furnace capital equipment business owner, new technology champion, and director of commercial E-Treating Services. His background includes highly specialized knowledge of gas nitriding, plasma nitriding, and LPC vacuum carburizing. Mark has earned a bachelor degree and a master degree in business. Uh, and he's a respected figure in the North American e-treating community. Mark also published various articles in the field of e-treating, nitriding, and low-pressure carburizing. At this time, I will, I will hand the floor to Jack and uh, to the panelists. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michel. Uh, today's discussion will uh, center around nitriding and carburizing as uh, surface hardening methods. Um, we'll talk also about cost factors in the surface hardening because those are one of the deciding factors in the choice of a technology. Uh, we'll also speak uh, on about some technical uh, aspects of both uh, nitriding and carburizing, such as distortion. Uh, and uh, we'll uh, finalize the uh, presentation with um, what's, well, the future is already now or yesterday, surface hardening for uh, electrical vehicles and internal combustion engine vehicles. Thank you very much. Uh, now, what is a surface treatment? Uh, it's a very wide uh, definition. What is it really? But from the uh, perspective of the end user, it is an engineered solution, uh, solution engineered uh, with the help of a heat treatment, of surface uh, treatment, uh, thermochemical uh, surface treatment, uh, designed for a specific application. Uh, so uh, each application, each type of gear, pinion, requires a specific surface treatment. Thank you. Uh, so uh, what is the uh, biggest difference between nitride and nitro carburize and, and carburizing? Uh, both uh, treatments are thermochemical treatments. Uh, they rely on different uh, mechanisms. Uh, in nitriding, uh, surface is hardened and modified using um, adsorption and diffusion um, of nitrogen. Um, and uh, this modifies chemically the surface, but does not really change the core of, uh, of any part or any component. Carburizing relies on the diffusion of carbon and the diffusion of carbon uh, at a much higher temperature uh, allows for a subsequent heat treatment, which consists of a quench and temper. And quench and temper temperatures, of course, will, um, will modify uh, core hardness as well as, as surface hardness. And the uh, amount and the depth of uh, diffusion of carbon will define the case uh, obtained on the carburized uh, component. Um, this is the main difference. And uh, obviously, those. Um, 
those uh, uh, curves don't really represent 100% of applications. Uh, when we compare carburizing and uh, nitriding, uh, one of the main things we will see is that uh, most nitrated steels will display a much harder case on the surface. So your surface hardness will be, uh, will be much harder and this hardness will carry in into the depth of the part uh, for a certain number of uh, thousands of an inch or, uh, or microns. Carburized steels typically start off with a um, lower, core, lower surface hardness. However, uh, the case depth is usually uh, much deeper. And uh, this, this, uh, this, this curve isn't really true because uh, the core hardness is affected and this core hardness may be harder or uh, softer depending on the, um, on the type of, um, uh, of treatment and the type of alloy obviously, uh, as well as uh, the, uh, the tempering temperature. So it's a, it's a process which may be modi which may modify both core hardness and surface car hardness. Um, and this really what's uh, what's setting apart uh, all the family of nitriding uh, processes and ferric nitrocarburizing processes uh, from other thermochemical processes, which are done at a much higher temperature. Uh, as you can see, uh, we are uh, performing nitriding and ferritic natural carburizing typically in the uh, uh, ferritic uh, temperature range, whereas uh, uh, carburizing is done above transformation temperature and always involves a quench and temper uh, procedure. Um, so uh, the purpose of surface treatments, as, uh, as I said before, is to um, increase surface hardness, reduce wear, and improve fatigue resistance. Um, applied uh, to gears, and uh, of course, this involves uh, the analysis of each application, uh, the type of, uh, of point loading, of, um, of, uh, of uh, gear design that may lead to a specific decision as, uh, as what uh, process will be applied in the end. Um, those uh, gears are uh, right now fixtured uh, for a um, um, thermochemical surface treatment. Uh, can you tell us more about it, Mark? Yeah, thank you, Jack, and uh, thank you, Michelle, for the introduction. Uh, what you're looking at here is our new low-pressure carburizing facility, which is part of Nitrex Heat Treating Services. Uh, Nitrex Heat Treating Services has quite a few facilities throughout the world. Uh, what you're seeing in our Aurora, Illinois facility uh, are gears that we're, we're treating. They're fairly heavy gears. Even though this is low pressure carburizing, these are being oil quenched. Our, our equipment in, uh, in Chicago does both oil quench or high pressure, pressure gas quenching up to 20 bar. Uh, of course, we also do gas nitriding and gas carburizing in this facility. Um, the gear, the gears you see here, as I mentioned, you see raw gears here on the right, and you see the tempered gears on the left that are uh, oil quenched, washed, and ready to go. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, Jack, maybe you can tell us about the differences between the steels used for carburizing and nitriding. Oh, you're on mute, Jack. I'm sorry, I was on mute. I didn't want, uh, we, are, we are several people here. We didn't have to pick up too much uh, of uh, extra noise. Um, okay, this comes actually from a, um, a Japanese company, Nippon Steel, uh, which has been developing um, uh, special steels uh, for nitriding uh, of automotive uh, uh, gearbox components. And, um, uh, it goes in the along with the history of the developing special alloys for nitriding because there are many gains 
uh, eventual gains in terms of uh, lubrication, uh, wear resistance uh, uh, to be to be to be had uh, from steels that are specifically um, uh, formulated uh, for nitriding. Uh, and uh, this is one of the uh, uh, research conclusions where um, uh, you can see that uh, the addition of uh, vanadium and chromium um, uh, will increase uh, the hardness uh, of, of gears. Uh, of course, uh, manganese is there, uh, but uh, and carbon will eventually uh, decrease the, uh, the the range of uh, of, of hardness. Uh, however. It's to be taken uh, up to a certain point because uh, in nitriding we are working um, with uh, quenched and tempered materials, usually for gears. Uh, usually, uh, this means that uh, the amount of carbon really defines the uh, the core hardness that you can obtain with the quenched and tempered process. So um, uh, we can go to the next slide and perhaps uh, look at. Um, a whole range of, uh, of steels. Now, um, uh, nitralloys have been developed almost 100 years ago, almost uh, probably in the late 1920s, um, as a fruit of research into nitriding. Of course, nitriding controls were nowhere uh, they stand up today, uh, but uh, and those, 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 those components had to be machined after nitriding because the, pro the process control was not uh, very good. However, uh, major manufacturers, uh, steel makers such as Krupp in Germany, uh, have come up with formulations uh, that, uh, among others, uh, have alloying elements such as uh, aluminum that allow them to obtain extremely uh, hard uh, components and uh, very high quality gears. Uh, so you have um, two main uh, uh, types of nitralloys that are used on the market. Uh, then you have a whole family of European grades uh, which are uh, also highly alloyed, uh, well, more alloyed than the, the everyday uh, 4140 or 4340 you find in North America. Uh, one of the ideas here is that if you look at, uh, at the chromium content, this chromium content is much higher. Uh, so those are not really low alloy steels and allow uh, for a much harder uh, surface and a, and a much harder case depth. Uh, and finally, you have uh, low alloy steels, uh, uh, typically 4140, 4340, and similar, which are uh, uh, everyday steels for uh, uh, the type of uh, uh, gear applications uh, found in North America. Uh, you will also find, and this is not in this table, uh, that uh, some uh, tool steels, such as uh, H13, for instance, are also used commonly for some, some types of, uh, some types of, of, of gearboxes. And uh, for uh, certain applications, you'll have as well um, uh, some stainless steels, such as precipitation hardened uh, 174, et cetera, et cetera. But those are, those are uh, small, small series and small quantities for aerospace applications. On the next slide, you see uh, the most common uh, steels used for carburizing. And the, the highly alloyed steels or, or, or alloyed steels include um, the uh, uh, 20 MN uh, chrome 5, uh, uh, 9310 in North America. Uh, those are the, uh, the better steels. But you have also a whole family of um, uh, carbon steels, which are uh, commonly used for, uh, for carburizing. Jack, I'd like to add here that uh, the difference is that the, the alloying elements that are used actually combine with the nitrogen for the hardness. So as Jack mentioned, that's your chromium, your vanadium, uh, your moly, et cetera. Whereas you saw on the carbon profiles there, the carbon steels, uh, there's very little alloying elements. And those elements that are put in there are used for core properties for primarily because the carbon is not combining with any other type of the alloy. Next slide. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, here we are looking um, again as, um, uh, at carburizing and nitriding. Um, we, have, we are bypassing uh, treatments such as uh, through hardening, induction hardening, and carbon nitriding, which are typically not used uh, for high uh, value added components. 
Thank you. So one of the um, uh, big differentiators between uh, nitriding and carburizing, and it has a huge impact on cost and uh, quality and uh, distortion, uh, is the type of, uh, of process uh, temperature and the type of, uh, uh, of sequence of, uh, of processing. At first, of course, there is a material selection and the material uh, that has been selected for an application, uh, depending on uh, torque, uh, uh, on, uh, on loading, etc., and speed will be hardened and tempered. You'll see here it's commonly uh, 228 to 32 Rockwell C, but uh, the, uh, the uh, quench and temper can be also done to a higher uh, hardness. Uh, it may um, be as high as uh, 38 when we have seen over 40 Rockwell C uh, core hardness for certain applications. After uh, this, uh, you'll see uh, rough machining followed by stress relief and finish, uh, final machining uh, with nitriding coming at the very last uh, step uh, of the manufacturing process. Uh, this makes a huge difference when comparing to carburizing because uh, carburizing has uh, within its own sequence of, uh, of, of treatment um, a, a quench and temper. So uh, components are not machined to their final dimensions or usually not machined to their final dimensions um, uh, uh, and then carburized. Uh, they are typically um, uh, machined, carburized to uh, diffuse the amount of carbon and the depth necessary to obtain the case depth. Then they are quenched, tampered and inspected to see what was the growth, distortion, etc. And finally, we have followed by a hard machining or final machining um, uh, on, uh, on, on, uh, as one of the last steps, if not the last step. So uh, comparing um, the processes in a different way, um, you have types of materials. We went over this and you see that Typically, because carburizing relies on the diffusion of carbon, you'll see usually steels that have less than 0.3% uh, of, uh, of carbon, and they may be extremely low carbon steels as well. Uh, whereas nitriding, uh, in nitriding, everything is possible. However, here we say all steels, cast iron, non-ferrous alloys, um, while well, most uh, high quality gears are made for, from steels that are formulated for nitriding. Uh, what really is the huge difference? Of course, here you have a temperature difference where uh, carburizing is, uh, is performed at uh, above uh, transformation temperature, uh, above 800 degrees uh, Celsius, above 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. Whereas nitriding typically will be done at temperatures in the range of four to 600 degrees Celsius. Uh, depending on, uh, on the core hardness and uh, allowable maximum temperature in order to prevent a, uh, um, a second temper, uh, uh, which is roughly 750 to uh, 1100 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can always expect uh, some degree of distortion from carburizing and in nitriding, on the other hand, uh, there is a very negligible if inexistent distortion. You may see some growth, uh, also very negligible, however, uh, no, no distortion if uh, stress relief was done properly. Um, uh, so carburizing may and often requires finished machining and nitriding usually does not. And uh, there is no improvement overall um, for corrosion resistance, whereas nitriding, there is an improvement. Uh, however, uh, Really, uh, for gears, it's not usually what we are looking for. Um, uh, the same quality, uh, same qualities of, of case that provides better uh, corrosion resistance uh, also provide usually a better lubricant retention, um, prevent micro welding, and make uh, for a um, quieter gear. But uh, we most gears don't require high corrosion resistance because they are oiled. Um, and uh, the same, uh, going stra straight from the same uh, point, um, the, uh, the chemistry uh, of uh, nitrided layers um, with nitrides uh, that, that improve the toughness 
and uh, eventually white layer that uh, that provides a better lubricant retention as well as um, as a good sliding wear resistance is shown here with a uh, pin on disc uh, test under two loads two different loads and you see that equivalent steels uh, the 18 HDT is a Euro European version of uh, 4140, somehow similar to 8620 in carburized uh, material. So you can see that, uh, uh, that the wear rate uh, is uh, much higher on carburized material. Uh, this is because uh, the tribology of uh, carburized uh, surfaces is much is poor uh, hardness may be there but it's uh, it's uh, it's not a um, if a, a type of surface that will uh, produce a uh, a better uh, uh, resistance to sliding wear uh, or to galling Now we look um, uh, very fast at this uh, at this uh, uh, experiment. It was done in uh, in Europe, uh, in France, as you may see. Uh, still, some uh, some of the French uh, uh, lettering is still there. So uh, this is rare, but uh, is used in some uh, high-end military applications, uh, earth-moving applications, and agriculture uh, as well. You have a dual process where uh, you have a component that has been carburized. And um, and uh, then has been nitrided on top. So of course, nitriding process in this case will yield a much harder surface, but also produce a compressive stress on the surface, which will uh, uh, help uh, uh, help the part withstand uh, higher bending, uh, fatigue, uh, etc. Uh, but the uh, the important part is that uh, nitriding processes can be formulated uh, from very low temperatures, so from below even 750 degrees Fahrenheit or um, or uh, 400 degrees Celsius. So we can avoid. Uh, uh, tampering again uh, the carburized component. Uh, so the processes have to be adjusted, obviously, but uh, this type of uh, dual duplex process can be and is performed. Please keep on going. Thank you. Okay, so you have here a general comparison um, um, uh, of uh, bending and pitting stress uh, endurance limits for gas nitrided and carburized materials. And um, what you can see is that uh, uh, typically uh, pitting um, uh, resistance may be somewhat similar in carburizing and, uh, and nitriding um, uh, and uh, bending, uh, uh, bending uh, fatigue resistance is, uh, is much, uh, much better. And uh, it goes back to, again, the compressive stress uh, level that we have been talking about uh, before. We read very often compressive stress as hardness uh, when you look at, uh, at uh, the curves. Uh, however, it is compressive stress and it is somewhat uh, best illustrated uh, by the last column to, the, to your right when you see a carburized component that has been um, Shot pinned. Uh, shot pinning is often used uh, in the many applications, one of them being uh, valve springs, for instance, you know, in, in autom automotive applications. But uh, shot pinning uh, does produce uh, compressive stress on the surface. And this compressive stress uh, performed on a carburized uh, component uh, improves uh, resistance to bending and uh, provides a, a better bending fatigue so uh, resistance. So it's a more enduring part and it illustrates why nitriding uh, naturally providing this, uh, this compressive stress uh, withstands better some of the applications. Um, again, uh, same illustration, but uh, much simpler. Uh, on the left hand side, you see uh, hardness for nitriding in orange and the hardness, initial hardness is higher um, carburizing initial hardness is lower. And carburizing have, produces uh, usually a hard or harder core. Uh, nitriding goes down to the, the core hardness of uh, the previous heat treatment, uh, original heat treatment on the steel component. But you can also see compressive stress, which is extremely high for nitriding and much lower for carburizing. And this compressive stress is what accounts for the difference in endurance to bending. 
um, one of the uh, points of interest also in designing uh, designing gear is um, 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 uh, contact or pitting stress limits. And uh, this is taken from a German uh, standard, the uh, DIN uh, uh, 3990, uh, which is uh, used for uh, the design of spur and helical gears. And you see that uh, nitriding steels uh, show a somewhat uh, uh, lesser, uh, lesser stress limit. Uh, they do overlap with carburizing uh, steels and better carburizing steels but they show a somewhat lesser limit in terms of uh, flank pressure, allowable flank pressure. Uh, but this is also very interesting and uh, goes back to why companies do develop special nitriding steels. When you look, um, uh, when you look at the resistance to uh, bending stress uh, and surface hardness together, and uh, specially formulated nitriding steels, uh, compare very well with uh, with carburizing steels. Uh, of course, we're talking about the better one, like uh, better ones like 9310, uh, where you can obtain a um, uh, a much better resistance to bending stress. Thank you, Jack. Uh, we've already had a number of questions of dealing with yeah, well, we, from, from your, we, we uh, do have a lot of questions, uh, Mark. I agree with yeah. you. Uh, so we'll all for the questions. Uh, and at the end, we'll see what we didn't cover and uh, we'll get back to uh, the main questions. Yeah, and, Sorry, and the Mark, questions you... on uh, distortion are, are good questions and that's actually part of our uh, presentation here. Uh, so distortion is a problem in heat treatment as everyone knows. It affects the dimensions of the finished part. Distortion can be controlled and much effort has been put into controlling distortion and heat treatment. The key differences from carburizing versus nitriding is the temperature at which we process. So let me explain this. Next slide. In carburizing, we must cool very fast, which is quenching. In oil quenching, the part basically is lowered into the oil this means non-uniform cooling by definition of how the part moves. In high pressure gas quenching, the gases do not act perfectly like liquids do. So we use very high pressures in order to mimic a liquid, but it is very hard to get even flows of gases around the parts, especially in more dense loads. So people have moved to different techniques to try to get rid of some of these problems, uh, like single part or single layer gas quenching. Uh, this is much better but it's still not perfect. Simply, when you heat up to such high temperatures uh, as in, in carburizing in the austenitic range, the material moves, grows, and distorts, and cooling only will add to this. So a, a, a neat process was created called press quenching. Here, a fixture is made to surround the part, uh, a gear or let's say a bearing race, and in order to hold the shape as the material tries to move. This works very well, but it is rather costly. Next slide. Nitriding is a bit different. We operate at lower temperature, the so-called phreatic temperature range. Uh, distortion can be controlled. Next. So Jack had this slide up before, and I saw some questions come up on this. Typically in nitriding, what we do is we select the material, which Jack had mentioned already, it's a different material. Uh, we put some different uh, alloying elements in there, which will add to the hardness, the surface hardness as the nitrogen combines with those elements. Uh, we harden and temper the steel first to get our core properties that we want for whatever process we have. We will rough machine, uh, take most of the material off, which actually will impart some stresses into the steel and then if you really want to control distortion, you do stress relief. Uh, this will take those stresses out and then your finished machining will take care of your dimensions. At this point, we can nitride, the parts will stay virtually unchanged. Uh, there is some growth, uh, but that can be managed. It's a very small, it's usually a 10 thousandths. Uh, carburizing, as was already mentioned, is a totally different process. Uh, and I think Jack covered this uh, very well. Next slide. Okay, different studies have been performed uh, on comparisons of nitriding versus carburizing as far as costs are concerned. Uh, you know, I've always heard over the years that 
nitriding is very expensive. Uh, well, uh, today that's not necessarily the case. Uh, nitriding with very large loads can be very cost competitive. Uh, carburizing, uh, as was discussed, involves many steps as well, uh, shown on the left. Uh, here we show that nitriding can actually save money. The steps are shown on the right. Uh, this is due to the no hard machining and we can process into large loads as mentioned and get the case requirements that, that we wanna have. So more engineers uh, and more manufacturers today are discovering that gas nitriding is a very viable option from a money standpoint. And as, as uh, Jack has been mentioning, it's a, a very technical, uh, technologically uh, viable process for getting the case properties that you want for the, for the material or the gear. Next. And lastly here, this was a very nice study done uh, about uh, 12 years ago in 2010 uh, by Bugliarello et al. And they wrote uh, a really nice uh, article in, in uh, Gear Solutions called Heat Treat Processes for Gears. There was a lot of information in here. We're only highlighting two. We're highlighting press quenching with carburizing and nitriding. As we mentioned before, the best uh, dimensional properties that you're going to get with carburizing is in press quenching. Even the authors here highlighted that nitriding, if done correctly, has less distortion than <clears throat> even press quenching. Uh, costs today for nitriding are much less than press quenching. Next slide. Jack. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, yeah, it's true that um, um, there are many reasons and factors why people choose to, uh, to uh, one technology over the other. Uh, obviously, one of them is because they are used uh, to, to performing carburizing in high volume, uh, which is true. Uh, it doesn't always uh, provide all the benefits that you expect from, uh, from it. Uh, however, um, those, those, those few examples will show uh, why nitriding can be chosen. And uh, this first example is uh, somewhat uh, strange because uh, here um, uh, the reason for uh, choosing nitriding is the, is the tribology, is the type of, uh, of surface we produce uh, for a quieter gear, for, uh, for something that will perform uh, with a very, very low coefficient of friction and without any distortion. So typically uh, you use uh, cast iron, but it's soft. Bo both materials are soft at core, but uh, nitriding is a, a, um, produces a white layer and in both cases uh, improves lubrication, uh, reduces completely uh, uh, um, wear uh, within at least uh, the warranty covering the vehicle. And, um, and provides for a very, very quiet gear. Uh, next. Uh, here, there are several examples of uh, um, gears used uh, in industrial gearboxes. And now, nitriding is being used here for a variety of reasons. One of them is, uh, if you look at the uh, bull gears in the center, those gears would be completely distorted uh, if you subjected them to, uh, to carburizing. And it's also the case for larger gears, which we don't show here for um, windmills and uh, large power generation. Uh, those gears simply, their geometry uh, makes uh, carburizing extremely difficult. Uh, they also subject usually to poor lubrication uh, in their environment because of their size. Uh, they are not entirely uh, enclosed in a very well lubricated uh, gearbox. Now you have also extremely hard uh, materials such as H13 uh, present here and uh, some pinions which are also, also usually for which we choose uh, nitriding because uh, of their shape and uh, tendency to uh, uh, not to distort in nitriding. Uh, that's an example of, uh, of power generation gears. That's a very uh, deep case uh, nitriding. Um, and uh, <clears throat> one of the notable uh, aspects here is that uh, those gears are, uh, are also, uh, they are, they're not necessarily uh, low speed gears. Uh, however, the, uh, their, their conditions of work and lubrication uh, requires nitriding. They are massive and uh, require a, um, a case depth of um, uh, over 32 uh, thousands of an inch. 
Um, here there are minute uh, gears used in aerospace. Uh, typically you'll see those in, uh, in aerospace actuators. Uh, typical materials here are stainless steels, uh, which are uh, here uh, uh, precipitation hardened steels, which means that uh, during the nitriding process, core hardness is also increasing uh, while the surface is being hardened. One of the examples here is uh, specifically a cluster gear for aerospace. Uh, to the right hand side at uh, the bottom, what you see and uh, one of the part of the evaluation is the uniformity uh, of, uh, of the case throughout, um, throughout all, on all sides of the gear. Um, so you have at uh, the root flank and, and top, uh, but also a very high hardness in this case, uh, over 1200 Vickers. Um, as well as a very, very thin white layer, which is almost inexistent in this case. Obviously, this is a nitralloy, and nitralloys specifically produce this type of, uh, of, of hardness gradients. And uh, well, those are low speed gears for marine propulsion. Uh, those type of gears, uh, one of the notable aspects is that uh, they get nitrided usually for uh, several days because uh, at the bottom you'll see the core hardness of those gears is 40 Rockwell C. Uh, they are very large. Um, you can equate uh, low speed gears for marine propulsion with uh, power generation because usually large ships, very large ships uh, are powered either by, uh, by diesel or turbines uh, or by uh, nuclear generators, which is basically a steam generator. So uh, those gears are high precision gears, um, uh, low speed um, and uh, must be nitrided for extremely quiet operation. Uh, one of the uh, also important aspects of this is that you have almost uh, no white layer on, uh, on the surface. Uh, one of the reasons is the, the loading of this gear, which is a low speed, however, extremely highly loaded gear. And at this point, uh, We'll uh, pass on to Mark because uh, the future is really, in, I guess, in uh, electrical vehicles. And uh, most of us heat treaters uh, uh, somehow dread uh, this, uh, this new evolution. <laughs> However, we'll see that it's not, uh, well, it's not as, uh, as yeah. bad as we think uh, because it's, uh, uh, heat treating is still there and the quality heat treating is definitely required. Well, thank you, Jack. And uh, just to, to transition from what you were talking about, those large marine gears we do regularly in our facilities in the US, we have a uh, 3.5 meter diameter furnace where we treat those gears. And they're pretty impressive uh, to see the process that, that is put into uh, uh, producing those gears. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum are electric vehicles. And, uh, you know, uh, do electric vehicles use gears? Uh, that's the big question. The answer is yes, uh, in a different way. Uh, I myself, I'm not an expert on electric vehicles, uh, but there, uh, after doing some research, there are many, many options coming to market. And I find this, mark, this, uh, this topic to be very interesting. Uh, we were recently at the ASM show, the Heat Treat Show in St. Louis in September, and there was a speaker there from Tesla and uh, they mentioned that they're trying to reduce heat treatments as much as possible in the vehicles. Well, we, of course, we could not believe this, right? So we did some research. And yes, things are changing. And there's many, many different variations coming uh, to market. But uh, to be honest, uh, there's a lot of parts, even in the electric vehicles, that still need uh, heat treatment. Uh, gears are no exception. As more companies engineer their own versions of electric vehicles, we see some interesting trends emerging. Uh, what are those trends? Gears, can you believe it? Next slide, please. This slide, this is, uh, yeah, this slide, thank you. Uh, what you're looking at here is actually the Porsche version of a two-speed uh, gearbox for their electric, uh, this is actually for the, uh, the, 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 uh, the Taycan that they have. And, um, what you have is uh, quite a few gears if you look at it. Uh, as you know, Porsche is part of the Volkswagen Audi family. Uh, Porsche argues that this gear set actually increases range by 5%. Uh, keep in mind that torque in electric motor is pretty even across the speed range, unlike uh, internal combustion engines. 
So however, gearboxes offer advantages and it seems more and more companies are migrating to gears. Next slide, please. The Ford Mach-E uses a single speed gear set made by Borg Warner. That's on your left there. ZF has designed a two speed uh, unit shown on the right. Uh, keep in mind also that automakers need to decide how to power the wheels. Do they power each individual wheel separately or like a standard auto, do they have central power source and distribute the power via a drivetrain? Many options are being engineered today and they do vary. Uh, we are seeing quite a few variations and more are being announced every day. Next, please. We had a very interesting project arrive at our Chicago, Illinois facility. This is from the University of Illinois. They have a, a, an engineering team there called the Illini Formula Electric or Formula E team, engineering team. And they're building their version of an electric race car. Uh, I found this to be uh, very exciting and interesting. Uh, they wanted some gears treated in our LPC system with high pressure gas quench. And uh, we are proudly helping to get that done for them. Next slide. So I asked them, why are you using these gears? You, know, you, can, you can see in their statement that they're looking at the power at each wheel. They have high load and torque, et cetera. And this type of uh, analysis is what is known in our industry as engineering. They have to make decisions. So our fellow engineers out there in the automotive world and, and, and in all industries, uh, today is the perfect time to look into new materials, new methods for doing your heat treatment, and uh, uh, new ways of, of, of uh, making your cars run. We obviously at Nitrex think gas nitriding is a very viable and interesting solution. Uh, Jack or I will be happy to discuss with any engineers how our company can help with your heat treatment and make your parts stronger, lighter, and quieter. Jack, uh, can you tell us, uh, based on our little uh, conversation here, if you have any, what the conclusions are? And I should say, too, that we've had quite a few questions, so we'll try to go through some of those uh, as they come through here. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, um, well, of course, yeah, we do have a bit of a bias uh, because we, uh, we started off and we are still a uh, company that... Uh, works in development and uh, of, of, of nitriding and better controls, etc. But we do also operate uh, uh, many uh, heat treat plants, including here in Montreal. Uh, so we, uh, we do perform both, uh, both processes and we see advantages uh, in one or the other. Now, uh, what can be definitely said about, uh, about nitriding is that it definitely guarantees um, uh, uh, very good uh, tribological uh, properties, and it does eliminate uh, gear distortion. Uh, for several gears and types of gears, it is cheaper uh, when you uh, think of the cost and iterations involved in, uh, in um, uh, quench press. Uh, for instance, uh, and uh, the cost of uh, final machining or rough machining or gauging uh, components which are manufactured uh, in high volume. Uh, so uh, eventually the choice comes between the two technologies really to the type of loading you see, uh, you see uh, um, uh, for gears and uh, do the gears have to withstand uh, certain uh, bending stress limits and um, do they, do they, can they be nitrided or carburized? What's the best choice? And finally, distortion also decides as well as economics. Uh, so uh, economics is one of the big factors. Uh, the other one is, uh, is engineering and distortion. And finally, nitriding is becoming uh, a very environmentally friendly process. Uh, compared to carburizing overall. So it's one of the decisive points uh, where you want to go and uh, how you want to design your gears. Very good, Jack. Uh, thank you so much, Jack. Uh, it's a great session. Uh, we, have, we have quite a turnout today. And congratulations to our marketing team for the presentation.
quality of the presentation and the turnout. Uh, um, uh, one thing I think that is important, Jack, and I think you can agree with me, the whole manufacturing process of automotive is also uh, very important for the, the automaker, the impact on the environment. Uh, and definitely the nitriding uh, brings uh, some credits to, to whoever wants to change the process and, and go with nitriding versus more traditional, uh, more poor, less environmentally friendly process. Okay, uh, we will start with the questions. Uh, we have about 38 questions. So I don't think we're gonna be able to, we're gonna do a quick uh, Q&A uh, and and the question we're not able to answer, we will probably, we will do a resume uh, and it will be distributed to the participant. Uh, we'll start with the first one. To, uh, Jack, I'll go with you. What are the advantages of carbonitriding versus carburizing? I think we, we touched a bit of that, but in, in a nutshell, uh, uh, what are the advantages of carbonitriding versus over-carburizing? Um, carbonitriding is usually done on, um, uh, is, is, it does not have many advantages for, uh, for, uh, uh, for gears. It is usually performed on, um, on um, uh, less value added components and at a lower temperature as well. So there is some advantage to carbonite trading when compared to, uh, to, to carburizing, uh, but it does not compare very well uh, with, uh, with nitriding. Nitriding provides the best, uh, the best solution, not, not carbonite trading. Perhaps you also want to comment on that, Mark. Do you? Yeah, uh, carbonite trading, typically you can get a very hard surface. Uh, so if you need a hard surface and you need it, uh, you know, not too deep, uh, that's a very effective, uh, cost-effective method for doing it. Uh, there are, you know, in, in gears, it may be too hard for the application. All right, very good. Um, another question here, uh, kindly indicate effects of alloys effects in combination as chromium with nickel and aluminum on surface hardness during nitriding. Uh, yeah, of course, um, aluminum is uh, most likely the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the alloy that produces with the, the lesser quantities, uh, the highest increase of hardness. And uh, second to aluminum, you, you have chromium. So it's uh, either or not exceeding certain, uh, certain proportions, of course, uh, because <clears throat> when you add up uh, the two together, you do obtain a much harder case. And you see it uh, in certain uh, um, nitro alloys, but you also see it in some uh, tool steels like H13 with the high chromium gradients. However, uh, you will notice also that it's difficult to obtain a deep case. It makes for a much more uh, expensive alloy. Now, nickel does, um, does, uh, does improve uh, certain qualities uh, of steel. Uh, and, uh, and and does improve uh, among other uh, say uh, torsion. It's used for longer parts. In used in pinions a lot, but nickel usually delays nitriding. So if you were to compare uh, everyday nitroloy one thirty five M for modified and nitroloy one thirty five N. Uh, for uh, nickel added, uh, the uh, if you compare processes, the uh, the processes that with uh, with N uh, are much longer. They may be uh, up to 15, 20 percent longer for a deeper case. One of the examples is uh, uh, plastic extrusion screws that are used in the plastic in, uh, pellet industry, where you um, have uh, uh, screws which are similar to, uh, to a meat grinder, but they compact pellets uh, to extrude plastic components. Uh, they may be up to five, 10 meters long, and they are typically uh, made from steels that may have additions of nickel uh, because they tend to break. But uh, this makes uh, the nitriding process much, much longer. Very good, Jack. Um, I know you touched on this in the presentation, but nitriding also brings benefits in, in the surface treatment, uh, not only on the hardness, but on the corrosion protection. Do you have a figure of uh, how many percentage of uh, corrosion, corrosion improvement uh, can be achieved by nitriding? 
Well, it's uh, it's not really in, in percentage. You have to compare uh, to compare the process using uh, samples uh, and using a salt spray uh, test, for instance. So you will number uh, will look at a number of hours uh, and that you can achieve with a certain type of uh, white layer uh, on a specific steel, and it changes with each steel and manufacturing technique. So there is no straightforward calculation of how what's the percentage. On a carburized component, you will see that the component will rust almost immediately. Uh, so nitriding compo nitrated components may uh, may rust uh, in anywhere from uh, from two days to uh, to a thousand hours, depending on what you're looking at and what types of materials you are using. Uh, for instance. Uh, um, induction hardened, uh, pre-induction hardened uh, hydraulic components made from uh, uh, 1045V uh, can, can last over 600 hours in a uh, salt spray cabinet, uh, whereas uh, uh, wiper shafts, for instance, made from resulfurized steel uh, will last uh, probably uh, up to 300 maximum. Uh, but again, those are processes formulated for corrosion resistance more than for gears because in gears you have high point loading and uh, because of this high point loading typically white layers will be reduced uh, to roughly uh, 12 to 14 um, microns or probably five tenths of a thousand of an inch yeah jack, hey, thank yeah. you jack the other thing we do is we we do a post oxidation process to help with the corrosion resistance and as jack mentioned typically you want to have a, a thicker white layer uh, and that's fine. That works very well for corrosion resistance. But if you're using it for wear, like Jack is talking about, you wouldn't have such a thick uh, white layer. Yeah, well, that was one of the questions of the, 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 the people uh, participating in the question and answer. Uh, do you leave the white layer after nitriding? Yes, uh, we do leave the white layer. Oh, of course, white layers are not always equal. So. Uh, well-controlled white layer, let's say AMS 275910 uh, uh, specification for, uh, for white layers. If you specify a certain type of white layer for a gear, uh, which usually, as I said, is, is below 12 or at 12 uh, microns uh, uh, thick or roughly uh, five tenths of a thousand, this is fine uh, without any porosity compact. Uh, if it's not a compact, it's a porous white layer in, uh, from a process performed in a, um, in, a, in, in a system without much control, uh, then this white layer may not be necessarily uh, desirable. Uh, also in, um, in extremely high, uh, high point, uh, extremely high point loading uh, um, specifications, you will find that uh, uh, white layer has to be limited even more. This is why I have shown some of the examples where you have a white layer that's uh, thinner than uh, probably three or, or four uh, uh, microns, uh, probably thinner than uh, uh, two tenths of a thousand of an inch. Okay, very good. Um, I know that uh, metal parts, uh, sorry, uh, additive manufacturing is gaining a lot of momentum in industry. Uh, is there any value of nitriding powder metal parts, uh, Mark? Uh, for, yeah, there, uh, there's, there's definite value for uh, nitriding powdered metal. The problem is it's rather porous. So gas nitriding is typically not the selected process. Typically what you would do is plasma nitride it because with, if it's not, if the density is low, you're going to get gases invading the, uh, the surface and causing some nitride networks that would be problematic. You will not get that with the plasma nitriding process. So plasma okay, nitriding would be the way to go. Okay, very good. There was a question also, uh, there were some green parts that were shown when we show some gears. Uh, and uh, also uh, there's a question about stainless steel. What kind of preparation do you need to do for a nitriding process in, a, in 30 seconds, Jack? Uh, what are the type of... Uh, Okay, well, there I know are, you put uh, paint and yes, no, well, a paint is just to prevent eventually it's a stop of paint, but it's only to prevent nitriding on some surfaces. This is not really a preparation as such, but uh, uh, in case of aerospace, it would be probably not paint, it would be probably copper plated. Uh, however, uh, preparation in terms of uh, uh, the parts responding to the process 
uh, more appropriately. So we'll look at uh, different types of activations. Uh, some companies that uh, I cannot uh, cite uh, where you would be using, um, uh, first of all, would uh, machine the parts and limit the amount of time between uh, machining and the final machining and, uh, and the nitriding. Then the parts would be cleaned up in a uh, acidic solution uh, from a company such as Houghton, for instance, um, that uh, manufactures these types of, uh, of, uh, of, of washing uh, liquids, well, especially uh, designed to, uh, to clean up some contaminants, but also per perhaps facilitate nitriding, and then uh, they are nitrided. Uh, you could also use uh, uh, shot blasting, uh, one of the other methods. And uh, finally, what we use most in uh, our system is activating in flight in the process. So we do have a certain amount of uh, certain types of, of processes with uh, spe specially uh, formulated uh, uh, additives during the process to, uh, to obtain a uniform uh, case depth, uniform white layer. All right, very good. Um, I know you touched on that, but uh, definitely there's uh, benefits to nitriding versus carburizing, but any issues or defect problems that could be induced with nitriding, uh, like cracking or any of the sort? Well, um, you, usually you, you won't find them. It's not uh, induced by nitriding. If it's poor nitriding, again, you can nitride in many types of uh, uh, of, of equipment and with the many different types of, uh, of controls with a good or a bad recipe. So obviously if you over nitride a, a component, uh, which we don't do, but um, uh, some people, it, it happens. If you over nitride, oversaturate with nitrogen, you produce compressive stress. You have seen this in the presentation. Uh, compressive stress up to a certain point uh, works well. But uh, in steels that have uh, many alloying elements such as chromium, this compressive stress and hardness uh, produced at one point exceeds the ability of, of the component to hold this compressive stress. At this point, you will see stress relief cracks. So stress relief cracks. And um, when you talk about hard uh, surfaces, you also say that probably crack propagation is much faster. So a badly done process or a badly controlled process uh, or design flow in the process recipe will lead to stress relief cracks. Right. So, so fundamentally, you need the right equipment and the right recipe, and uh, and then correct. you you yes. you limit your your you limit your risk yes. in terms of having. Uh, yes, it doesn't. It, it, it doesn't take much to nitride a part. It's, it takes a lot to to do it correctly. It's, it's Jack, like Jack baking a pie, Michelle, you know. Jack yeah. and Michelle, uh, we've had a number of questions, and we're running out of time about yeah. stainless, stainless steels. Uh, Jack, could you discuss a little bit about uh, activation of the surface now we uh, nitride stainless steel? Well, uh, up to a certain point, yes. Uh, obviously, <laughs> I cannot say exactly what we do to the, the last point, but the idea here is to, uh, to depassivate uh, in a way. So um, some steels do nitride uh, uh, much better than others. Uh, some austenitic, let's say, uh, steels like... Uh, a typical uh, 316 will nitride or nitrocarburize relatively easily. Um, and some 400 series martensitic stainless steels may also nitride uh, in an easier way. Uh, however, if you um, want to obtain uh, uniform layers and uh, uniform hardness uh, on all component sides, um, Typically, uh, you need to depassivate. One of the most common methods uh, used is using many types of, uh, of halogens. So um, uh, you'll see- Yeah, and Jack, you could also just uh, blast the part ahead of time. And yes, I mentioned that, I mentioned oxygen. that. Right. Yes, uh, it, it really depends on the, on the material. Right. If it's 310, it may be a bit more difficult. If it's 316, it will be much easier. Yeah. If it's a martensitic stainless steel, it may, may be even much more uh, easy than the, to, to perform, um, obviously, than, uh, than on some other materials. So it does depend, and it depends also on the type of work performed on the steel, because uh, some of the um, deformations uh, coming, let's say, from fine blanking or other manufacturing methods uh, right. can, uh, can bring in a lack of uniformity. Yeah. 
And if you if Very you good. buy the furnace from us, we will make sure it uh, it properly treats the the stainless steels. Or if you want to treat your parts through our heat treat services, we will uh, do the proper process and make sure that you get the uh, stainlesses nitrided properly. Uh, uh, great questions. I'm sorry that there's uh, we're we'll do last right one now. last one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll one do one last one, Mark, do? if you don't mind. One last sure. one, because I think that's a good one here. What is the biggest module you've ever nitrated uh, for uh, maybe for wind energy or submarine? You mentioned submarine. How big can we go? Uh, for, well, uh, we can go uh, in, in the U.S. We can go 3.5 meter diameter. So if we have a gear, that's pretty big. Uh, someone helped me with the inches. But anyway, it's uh, 3.5 meters. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we also can do uh, parts up to about uh, 200 inches long in one of our other large uh, furnaces. Uh, we typically do some different types of dyes in there or assemblies uh, or very large loads. So we have a lot of options as well. We can do vertical uh, in, in, in at least 4.5 meters of length. Uh, and uh, we're we're doing some very large uh, parts in, in that regard as well. So we, that's one of Nitrex's specialties for our heat treating services are all the, the, the difficult dimensions that you're discussing. Yes, Mark, uh, this right. uh, 3.5 meters uh, was actually 11 and a half feet, roughly. Okay. Very good. Hey guys, uh, we're running out of time. We have, we have so many great questions. We're gonna do a recap and uh, try to answer as many as possible and get back to the uh, everybody who participated. We have an amazing turnout today. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Mark. Thanks to everybody in the marketing team. We did a fantastic job putting the presentation and working with Jack and Mark and myself. Uh, great work, guys. And uh, thank you so much to everybody who participated. Uh, we learned every time I talk to Mark and Jack, I, I learned something new. And today we, I think we all learned something new to, uh, on this uh, night trading uh, gears. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you very much for attending. Thank Have you, a everyone. great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.